The Great Depression stalked the pine thickets like the Grim Reaper. The land dried up and the money with it. No one knew that wealth lay deep within the dust-powdered landscape, a river of oil. And this is the story of the men who found it, a crippled old wildcatter and a man who believed a fortune teller. When all hope was gone, they dared to drill. During the early years of the 20th century, farmers found themselves linked to acreage that showed them no mercy, and their hopes withered and died away as surely as their crops. Kilgore merchants either sold on credit or they didn't sell at all. They took a man's word that he would pay all he could when he could, but then a man's word was about all he had left. Kilgore's population had grown to 300 souls, all gambling on land that left their crops lying brittle in the fields. There was one street facing the railroad track, one on the other side facing the railroad track. It was different and colorful, in all dirt roads and wooden sidewalks, just like an old Western movie set. These early, early, early homes with the porches around them and the barns beside the house, the cow and the hogs and chickens all in the yard. The only way you could bring income into the family was by growing something and then selling it to somebody else. So there was a market for things that were produced or grown in the fields. Men would turn their horses loose in the street at night in the summertime. Everybody had a picket fence, but there was always grass that grew between the picket fence and the dirt road where the wagons kept the grass off of it. So the horses would graze the town all night and keep the grass down. The kids didn't have to cut the grass. Before oil, transportation was basically horse and buggy, horses and wagons and, and things like that. A few people had automobiles, but not a lot. Men tended cattle or chopped cotton, and women sewed and gardened, cooked, and nursed their babies. Their only connection with any world outside of their own was a battery-operated radio. We had a radio, and it, my dad got a car battery and put under a table and put the radio on top, and we could only listen to it for uh, about two hours a, a day. Dirt farmers raised 10 to 15 bales of cotton. While they waited for their cotton to grow, they'd cut and sell cross ties. When I came to Kilgore, there were 30,000 bales of cotton grown in the Gregg County. There used to be three, three cotton gins right here in town. The amount of cotton early on that they grew was, was really big. And a bale of cotton weighed about seven, 800 pounds. So they, had, they would do, do thousands and thousands of bales of cotton that they would take to market. The ING and Railroad started pushing west and they needed all the cross ties they could find. And they would put them on boxcars and take them down to where the rail was still being put out. But now cotton was no longer regarded as king. So much of the woodlands had been cut that the timber industry was losing its luster. Many would have packed up and left, but there was no place to go. The road out of town was no better than the roadway in. In 1908, Lynch Reynolds and Werner Florence brought the town's first movie theater to a blacksmith shop that stood on the corner of Maine and North Kilgore. A young lad named Leggett Krim sold tickets, worked in the projection booth, and swept up when the lights faded to black on the final frame of film. Kilgore began featuring an air dome in 1912, offering a genuine open air fenced in picture show with benches and an outdoor screen. It became a popular gathering place on warm summer nights when the daily grind of a hard day could be lost in the flickering visions of black and white. Frank Osborne, sometime around 1918, decided to go into show business as well. He sold his telephone company and built the Cozy Theater and sold it two years later to Leggett Krim. He bought it in 1918 and uh, moved it across the street into North Commerce Street and he called it the Krim Theater. L.N. Krim was kind of, he was a real showman who had uh, theaters. He had theaters here in Kilgore and, and scattered around the state. 
Leggett was ahead of his time on a lot of things. He's quite sophisticated for a man raised up in the country. The stars of the silent, cozy screen were George O'Brien, Harold Lloyd, and the seductive Theta Barra. And the action was backed by the happy-go-lucky music of a Victrola. It didn't take Leggett Krim long to install a player piano, and it was his self-appointed duty to pedal the piano himself. The cozy moved, became the Dixie, and ushered in the new era of the motion picture industry. In 1928, its screen was lit with the images of My Man, starring Fanny Bryce. The place was packed, the crowd breathless. People in the movies were actually talking, and people were buying tickets just so they could actually hear voices spilling out of a machine called the Dixie Phone. The wonders of science and technology, they figured, had gone just about as far as they could go. The war between the states had been only a recent memory when a few wildcatters tore into the earth with their drill bits and even produced a little oil. But the cost to find it was far more than the oil was worth, and the shallow wells were finally shut down and forgotten. I believe there was a well that was drilled in Russ County that was uh, a mile or two west of the boundary of the field, which was a dry hole, and then before the Lanthrop well in Gregg County, uh, someone had drilled a well east of the oil field and missed it by about a mile and a half. Everything looked, from a geologic perspective, like this was a perfect place to find oil. Geologists from several of the nation's major oil companies had long been tempted and taunted by the suspicion that oil lay beneath the pines. They explored the land and discovered absolutely nothing that would cause them to invest a dime or a fortune in worthless dirt that might be good for cotton, but little else. Their report said East Texas was barren. The geologists tossed their samples away, packed up their equipment, and headed down winding roads that would take them to other fields where the dirt smelled more like oil and money. Malcolm, he still insisted that there was oil, and uh, he promoted it as well as he could. They tested the depths of Rust County, drilling 17 wells. They discovered dirt as dry beneath the ground as it was on top. So the geologists kind of backed off, wiped their hands clean, and said, this is barren land. This is land that does not have anything but dust and rocks and more rocks. And they packed up and walked away. The farmers kept right on plowing and planting. The cotton stalks might be stunted and spindly, but they were real. Oil was a myth. Malcolm Krim was not a farmer. He owned a little mercantile store downtown. As the decade of the 20s wound down, his cash drawer was filled with a few coins and greenbacks, but mostly IOUs. Krim ignored the reports from geologists. He paid no attention to the 17 wells that tempted East Texas before coming up dry. Krim merely wrote it off to bad luck. After all, he had it on good authority that oil did indeed reside beneath the pine straw. The story is he was at uh, some resort, I think it was like mineral wells. Uh, they used to take the baths and things like that. Well, this was in the 20s and a fortune teller, uh, he was killing time and found this fortune teller and she described the farm exactly how it was bounded by a creek and where it was, how many acres it was. The fortune teller told him that there was great, vast oceans of oil beneath his mother's farmland. Malcolm Krim began obtaining scattered leases on 30,000 acres in 1920. Now all he needed to do was track down some driller, any driller, who had enough faith in Krim's fortune teller to sink a wildcat well somewhere, anywhere, on the acreage he had been able to tie together. And they owned about a thousand acres at their Laird Hill. And at that time, it was, 20, I think, about 20 acres to a well. And later, it was reached down to about 10. He truly believed there was, there was oil under the farm, and he worked to, to promote it and to get somebody in here to drill it. To each independent oil company he found, 
Krim made the same offer. Move your drilling rig in here and drill anywhere you please, and I'll give you the lease on every foot of the land. His plea fell on deaf ears. Everybody looked at East Texas. They looked at the old reports. They sadly shook their heads and said, no, we're not drilling in East Texas. You might as well keep farming the land. The town came into existence when Buck Kilgore, who had represented Texas in the U.S. House of Representatives, heard that railroad magnate Jay Gould wanted to bring his trains through East Texas. He donated the land, and a new little hamlet called Kilgore grew up around the tracks. An old mule barn had been turned into a depot, and Thomas Elmer Phillips arrived in 1931 to serve as the station agent for the Missouri Pacific Railroad. Housing was scarce. He and his wife, Murty, had no place to stay. They slept in the terminal at night until Missouri Pacific officials dragged one of Jay Gould's old railroad cars into town and parked it on a sidetrack not far from the Dean Keener Krim home, the oldest home in town built in 1874. The railroad car, filled with Gould's fine furnishings, was known as the Atalanta, the goddess of speed. The whole basis of black people in Texas was slavery. It goes back to slavery. This was Spanish country. If you look at the land grants, the land grants were Mexican. Sam Houston, Stephen F. Austin dissolved all the Mexican land grants. The first group was the 300, and then the doors just opened up for everybody to come. And they came up until, until, until the Civil War. And they were selling land in 5, 10, 15,000 acre tracks. After the, the slavery had ended, land was still relatively cheap at that time. So you have to really figure that up until 1930, land was, you could get land for little or nothing. But you had a whole chunk of the population that was poorly educated. School, the school system hadn't been set up and they were just really kind of beginning to the fifth grade type education. They could teach you how to read and write and how to count and things like that, but you didn't know anything about economics or, or anything. After 1865, there were there were there slavery didn't exist, so they weren't there weren't the everything was ba basically sharecropping. And as time went on, as we got to closer to 1900, 1920, and 1930, a lot of the African Americans were able to buy land in their primary business was was growing food pre oil boom and even after the oil boom the crops were people still grew cotton they did grew cotton at, at that time and they also had they also grew corn and different types of, of vegetables a lot of peas sugarcane was really popular so a lot of we had a few sugarcane meals around here a lot of the cotton was taken to louisiana to treeport where they would ship it down to uh, to New Orleans to, to go to Europe. You got to remember that this wasn't this wasn't a, a, a highly populated area, and it it was it was a rural population. So it, it was a you just came into town maybe once or twice a, a month. You didn't come to town every day like we do now. So they had they had merchants here that just traded in the basic things that that you needed. This is all before modern grocery stores. It was a segregated city, a segregated area. The blacks stayed all in the area with African-Americans and black people, and then the whites stayed in, in their area. There weren't, wasn't a lot of mixing. Many of the businesses and things like that, they didn't, didn't have black people that, that, that really participated in any of the, in the business activities, but there were a lot of black people who made money cleaning up houses for, for whites. And then there were people who just just did little little side things to, to, to make money to survive. But primarily survival was based on your ability to grow whatever you needed to to supply your comp, your your household. After the, the, the cotton industry collapsed, a lot of the a lot of the plantation owners left. A lot of African Americans ended up with the property. Up until 1920, the population was 55% black, but African Americans, due to Jim Crow, had no political power whatsoever. So we just, they were just, they were just here.
most people thought he was crazy to start with, but he had a, he had his own old mind about where that edge of that oil field was out there. Columbus Marion Joyner wandered into town wearing a white shirt, frayed from too many washings, wingtip shoes, and a straw boater. His stature had been whittled down from a childhood bout with rheumatic fever. He was crippled and looked far older than his 70 years, a silver-tongued scoundrel with an unquenchable thirst for black gold. But one night, he had a dream. And in this dream, he was told that he was destined to find one of the greatest oil fields in the history of the world. Dad Joyner was always looking for the big strike and had never found it. Dad Joyner got up the next day and got pencils and paper and, and started sketching out exactly the landscape that he had seen in his dream. And it had rolling hills and pine forests. And for all the world, it looked exactly like East Texas. He had an office in Overton and at Walter Tucker's mercantile store. It was a basement. It was a little room in the back. That's all he could afford. And he began looking for leases. Daily, Joyner checked the obituaries, primarily in Dallas. Then with a Bible tucked reverently under his arm, he would pay his respects to rich and grieving widows who just might have a few dollars to invest in his next oil scheme. He once admitted confidently, every woman has a certain place on her neck, and when I touch it, she automatically starts writing me checks. I may be the only man on earth who knows how to locate that spot, which he knew was much easier and quicker to find than oil. His whole life, Joyner once said, had been dictated by a scripture hidden away in the 49th chapter of Jeremiah. Let the widows trust in me. He had $45 in his pocket, and he was quietly buying up oil leases from hungry farmers and homesteaders who thought that a dollar an acre was big money. Those oil companies that left dry holes did not possess a report titled The Geological, Topographical, and Petroliferous Survey Portion of Russ County, Texas. Dad Joyner did. It had been prepared by the renowned self-styled geologist, physician, and petroleum engineer, Albert Durham Doc Lloyd. Doc wore jodhpurs, knee-high laced boots, and a Mexican sombrero, and few in East Texas knew that Doc Lloyd had graduated with a Doctor of Medicine degree from the American Electric Medical College. During a peripatetic lifetime, Doc had served time as a druggist, veterinarian, and a government chemist who trekked westward during the Idaho gold rush. He prospected for gold, then oil, in the Yukon, then Mexico, gaining notoriety as the impresario of Dr. Alonzo Durham's great medicine show. That he went from town to town peddling medicine that he had concocted from oil. Doc Lloyd had a fabulous and interesting and somewhat uh, shady kind of reputation. Now, a lot of people look back and said, Doc Lloyd was just a, a snake oil salesman. He really wasn't a geologist. Doc Lloyd was a serious physician. His Health Herald in 1899 described his show as bringing glad tidings to suffering humanity. Doc referred to himself as a finder of fortunes. He and Dad Joyner swore they knew things about the mysteries of the earth that the great oil companies would never understand. He had studied the earth, and he understood the earth. And more importantly, he understood what lay far beneath the earth. The summer of 1927 hammered East Texas with unmerciful heat. Dad Joyner sat down with Daisy Bradford, and with as much poetry as his old heart could muster, explained how fortunes made from oil could greatly benefit the impoverished region that was suffering from the curse of the Great Depression. His words painted vivid portraits of new schools, new hospitals, new museums. Hunger would have to pack up and go somewhere else because tables would be full for a change, he said. There would be jobs for men and groceries for babies. Dad Joyner could make it happen, he said. 
All he needed was leases on her land. The old wildcatter could drill anywhere he wanted in East Texas, but it was her land that sheltered the oil. She had a farm outside of Henderson, near what today is Joynerville. Bradford would give him money just so he could keep on going. Anyway, it took him quite a bit of time to get, to get that well drilled down. She was a God-fearing Christian. She read the Bible. She believed in the Bible. She worried about her neighbors. He said, if you let me drill, if you give me the leases on your farm and let me drill for oil, we'll find a great oil well. We'll find a treasure trove that all the kings of the world might covet. Doc Lloyd had no doubts about the secrets lying beneath his boots. In 1927, he had written Dad Joyner, you will surely be successful in discovering one of the largest oil fields in the world. You're certain to make a well in the woodbine sand at 3,550 feet. Lloyd and uh, Joyner had teamed together in Oklahoma at the old cement field and they drilled within 16 or 17 feet uh, finding that field and uh, they quit 17 feet short. His geological report was as scientific as any he had ever produced. On a map, Doc Lloyd had drawn straight lines connecting every major oil field in the country, from Arkansas and Kansas, from Oklahoma and Pennsylvania, from California and Spindletop down near the Texas coast. The lines may have resembled an odd geometric shape, but he predicted that oil would surely be found somewhere in the middle, which just happened to be the East Texas landscape. This, Doc Lloyd boldly proclaimed, brings about a state known in the oil business as the apex of the apex, a situation not found anywhere else in the world. The farmers looked at the map in the report and nodded. It was so simple that even they could understand it. Doc Lloyd never told anyone what the apex of the apex meant, and nobody ever asked him. The farmers who had invested, the farmers who had, had given money uh, for Dad Joyner, they understood these straight lines. They never understood geologic terms like Jurassic and Precambrian and Cretaceous. So they believed that Doc Lloyd was the real deal. The time for waiting had come to an end. Dad Joyner stood on the edge of Daisy Bradford's pasture and watched as the pine and oak derrick began to rise like a wooden skeleton from the shadows of a thicket. A pile of secondhand equipment lay in the dust. For almost two years, he had sold leases, some more than once, scraping enough money together to sink the Daisy Bradford number one. And it was as motley a crew as you would ever find on the oil field. He had the owner of a general store, he had some farmers, he had a moonshiner, he had a uh, miner, had a 15-year-old boy that had been hired to catch catfish so the crew would have something to eat. The roustabouts earned $3 a day. The driller received a dollar more, as well as $2 a day in lease interest if, perchance, he did find oil in the bottom of the hole. On a bright May morning in 1929, the moonshiner on the crew distilled a little homemade corn whiskey. They toasted the well, smashed the jug on a rotary table for good luck, and the teeth of Dad's drill bit touched East Texas soil for the first time. We're going to get us the well of the world, Dad Joyner said. How could a man fail standing on top of the apex of the apex that Doc Lloyd had drawn on the face of a weather-stained map? No one had watched the exasperating failures of Dad Joyner's poor boy venture with more interest than Malcolm Krim. Even while the old wildcatter was preparing to drill Daisy Bradford number three, Krim was meeting in Kilgore with two employees of a little independent Fort Worth oil company operated by Ed Bateman. He found Ed Bateman and they put a drilling deal together. Bateman had been a poet, an author, and newspaperman with the Dallas Times-Herald. 
and he was intrigued with the promise of oil in East Texas. He had a little family-owned oil operation. His wife worked for the company. Her brother was the driller. And the only problem Ed Bateman had, he had a drilling company. He had never found a drop of oil. Ed Bateman didn't have a lot of money, but he wasn't afraid to take a chance at a time when the Great Depression was selfish with its chances. Crim's offer was fair, he thought, but he was troubled because the leases were scattered all over the countryside. I can't drill, Bateman said, unless you deliver me at least 1,500 acres in the same block. She had 1,000 acres to lease. And at that time, it was, 20, I think, about 20 acres to a well. Malcolm Crim drove out to the farms of his neighbors and discussed the proposition with the Peterson and Laird families. What did they have to lose? The very worst they could expect was a hole in the ground, and there might even be oil in it. When Krem sat down with Bateman again, he had managed to tie 1,494 acres together in one place. Bateman grinned. It wasn't exactly what he had asked for, but it was close enough. Both men, whether they liked it or not, would just have to take what they could get. Lou Della Crim's father, Captain John Martin Thompson, had founded a huge lumbering empire in East Texas, and he wanted to bequeath his fortune to his children when he died. Well, my ancestors were in the timber business, and, and they had Thompson Lumber Company, and they were very active in uh, Trinity and Montgomery counties. They had about two or three big sawmills down in South Texas where the big pine trees were and they owned about a thousand acres at their Laird Hill. People realized how big an outfit the Thompson Lumber Company was. There were a huge amount of pine trees in East Texas, so they farmed and shipped lumber all over the country. And when John Martin Thompson, the father of Lou Della Crim, when he died, they divided up the sawmills that the sons ran and they also had some property in East Texas, south of Kilgore. The, all the boys got a sawmill, and Lou Della Crim, my great-grandmother, got an 888-acre pig farm in East Texas. She farmed on a few acres, but most of the dirt went to waste. But they were suffering like everybody else was suffering. It had been drought, dry, no rain. The cotton was stunted. The crops were burning in the field. When her son wanted to drill for oil, she decided a hole or two out on distant acreage she never saw anyway certainly wouldn't make any difference to her. You know, it sounded like she was slighted in that, but it turns out that it worked out real well. All of East Texas was watching the commotion down on Daisy Bradford's farm. People were selling hamburgers. People were renting them cots for $12 a night. A few people left, but, but, but five or 6,000 people stayed and, and, and cars lined the road for miles going back to Overton and going back to Henderson. Including oil scouts from Sinclair, Texaco, Shell, and Humble as well as an out-of-town oil man smoking a cigar and thoroughly fascinated by the shoestring gamble of Columbus Marion Joyner. The oil man introduced himself as H.L. Hunt. He said he wasn't quite sure if the Deep Well Wildcat venture was scheme or scam, but he wanted to be around when the hole was finished, wet or dry. If Doc Lloyd's calculations were right, there would be oil seeping through woodbine sand at 3,550 feet. Dad was less than a thousand feet away. He wondered if the derrick could withstand the pressure. One mistake and it was over. One mistake and the Great Depression would linger like a black shadow over East Texas. The bit shredded its way past 3,100 feet. Each foot might be the last one. Dad Joyner was getting ready to have a test. And he knew that this test would tell him where they were getting close to oil or where they weren't getting close to oil. They were down at 3,500 feet. Laster knew that they couldn't go much further. The rig was 
was, was shaking. The ground was trembling. Late at night, Ed Laster cored the well. Wearily, he threw one of the core samples into his car and left behind a couple of hope buckets filled with the drippings on the derrick floor. That night, the color of East Texas changed forever. It became the color of oil. The air in East Texas was thick with the smell of oil and rumors of oil. On the morning of October 3rd, a mob of believers and skeptics began gathering in a clearing beside Daisy Bradford No. 3. A string of automobiles crowded the seven miles from Overton to the well. Before the day ended, the crowd would grow to 8,000, all waiting to see if the hole would make money or break hearts that had been broken before. Everybody wanted to see the oil well come in. And they looked up that day and everybody was there, everybody but Dad Joyner. The old wildcatter was nowhere in sight. Gossip was running rampant. Dad Joyner was ill, or worse, hiding and afraid to face the crowd. Some smelled a hoax. Dad's got our money and gone, they feared. In the middle of the afternoon, Dad Joyner suddenly appeared, walking through the crowd. He had been out all morning trying to sell more leases. Oil fever swarmed the pines. It seemed as though prices were doubling every time a lease changed hands, and they kept changing hands all day and far into the night. For lease hounds, it became a seller's market. Oil leases were selling for $400 a piece, and within two weeks after the drill stem test revealed mud spackled with oil, more than 2,000 land sales and leases were duly recorded in the Rust County Courthouse. Even major oil companies were beginning to hedge their bets. Humble slipped in and quietly bought 16,000 acres when the going price was $20 an acre. When the oil field had brought the uh, Daisy Bradford well was brought in, everyone in the country knew it was a good well. And from all these other places, they flocked into, into the area. Shell, Sinclair, and Amarada were grabbing up parcels of farmland they had ignored weeks before. This might be the one, they thought. Then again, it might not. The rig cast a web of frantic shadows in the late afternoon sun. The pipes groaned wearily as the crew worked into the night amidst smoke and the stench of burning rubber. The ground obviously had no intention of giving up its oil without a fight. The crowd grew smaller. Many gave up and headed home. They had been disappointed before, but Laster kept the drilling bit turning. The earth began to tremble. There was a roar way down deep in the ground. The rig was shaking. It was threatening to break apart at any moment. It shook and shuddered and almost shattered with a pillar of oil belching its way out of the abyss of a deep pit, showering the pines and painting the bright sky the color of ebony. And all of a sudden, a sheriff came running through the crowd, screaming, put out your cigarettes, put out your cigars, don't light any matches. If this thing blows and we have fire out here, the whole countryside will go up in flames. And oil fell like a warm, gentle rain upon the ground around them, touching the shoulders of the just and the unjust, the sinners and the repentant alike. Daisy Bradford was dancing with, with oil and sand speckled on her face. Dad Joyner is reputed to have said, I always dreamed it, I just never believed it. But in October of 1930, the Daisy Bradford was finished. Thousands of people were on hand when it came in as a modest producer, about 300 barrels of oil a day. On that night, in East Texas, Dad Joyner had found the great oil field that had always saluted him. Dad Joyner found the field that broke the stranglehold that the Great Depression had on the nation.
Dad Joyner's oil was spilling across the crop rows that led towards Kilgore, and it was rich enough to wipe away the hard times of every hamlet and farmstead it touched. Everyone wanted land, or a lease, or a piece of somebody else's royalty. Folks kept showing up with satchels full of leases they had bought from Dad Joyner. During his desperate years of raising money to finance his wildcat well, Dad Joyner had sold the same leases too many times to too many different people. He had uh, more partners than he had leases, and the titles were cloudy. Now they all wanted their portion of the riches that flowed from the Daisy Bradford No. 3. Dad Joyner decided he had one viable option to escape the wrath of angry leaseholders and slanderous lawyers. He would sell out to H.L. Hunt and let the Hunt Oil Company's battery of attorneys deal with the problems. He never lost a lease, and that block proved to be one of the the start of one of the great oil stories and adventures in American history. H.L. Hunt and the old wildcatter sat down together in a Dallas hotel room, and for two days they negotiated and argued, fought and haggled over the purchase of a majority interest in 4,400 acres of Dad Joyner's Rust County oil leases. Dad Joyner was ready to make a deal. Hunt was stalling for time, trying to figure out if the discovery well was a boom or a bust. Within days after the Daisy Bradford No. 3 belched oil, wells had been drilled in two other locations. Both came up dry. Now Hunt was keeping a close watch on the Ashby well that the Deep Rock Oil Company had cut into ground surrounded by leases still held by Dad Joyner. The phone rang in the hotel room, and the waiting was over. H.L. Hunt's scout had been allowed to see the oil core. The drill bit had hit woodbine sand and it was saturated with the color and the smell of oil. The deal between Joyner and H.L. Hunt is said to be $45,000 in cash, $15,000 uh, notes, two in a row, and a million dollars worth of money from oil produced on the leases. Hunt slowly began the task of defending himself against more than 200 lawsuits, he settled most of the legal disagreements out of court for $250 or less. And uh, within a year or so, over 900 wells were drilled on the uh, Joiner leases. Three weeks and two days after Malcolm Krim gathered together with the multitudes to watch Dad Joiner draw oil from the bottom of Daisy Bradford's farm, he and Ed Bateman spudded in their own well on Lou Della's farmstead four miles south of Kilgore. They were trying to dig their way out of the Great Depression with a drill bit, searching for oil. Both men were wagering every dime they had to spend on a hole that neither of them could afford. They hired a well-known geologist, Bill Grozinski, who went out to Lou Della's farmstead and, and he diligently searched all day long. He studied the land. He studied the creeks, he studied the ridges, he studied the rise and fall of the landscape. He would stake out a place, study it for a while, then pull up the stakes and go somewhere else. If oil was indeed beneath his feet, he was determined to find the right spot. He knew he could not afford to make a mistake. Bill Grigensky summoned up all the geologic knowledge he had mastered and elected to drill beside a creek. In reality, the geologist could have staked the well for miles in any direction and found oil bubbling beneath the farmstead. Because this river of oil that's wide in some places and narrow in some places, it was as wide as it would get under the Ludella farmland. So the drilling began and all of Kilgore held its breath. The drill bit chewed its way down to 2,500 feet, and the old coffee pot rig began to bend and shudder. If the manufacturer was right, it couldn't go any deeper, and the mud on the bit neither tasted nor smelled like oil. The bit broke. Malcolm Krim drove back to his store, took out 86 hard-earned dollars, and gave them to Bateman to buy a new one. The Dudella Krim well located at Laird Hill was drilled in a couple of days before Christmas 
in 1930. Christmas came, and no one on the rig had any cause to celebrate. But a day later, Checkbook Kane drilled into the elusive woodbine sand and found unmistakable traces of oil in the core sample. Well comes in in this part of the early days. They didn't drill the well, the drilling rig didn't drill into the sand. The drilling rig came in and drilled to the sand. Now, you, how did they know when they hit the sand? They had all this 3,500 feet of drill stem and all at once it started bouncing. Around him, the wooden derrick was bowing heavily under the strain, but it refused to break. Now all Kane had to do was hold the rig together until oil blew it out from under him. Lou Delacrim drilled their well in out there. Old settlers here flocked out there because they had drilled a well at Daisy Bradford, and this was the offset well at Laird Hill, located probably 20 miles from the last well that was drilled. And so people from all over Kilgore, old settlers, they went out there. And when the well was supposed to be brought, it brought in. And when they brought it in, the well went over the top. We had heard it was going to come in that morning. So we all got together and we missed church and went out to Ludella Crib all the well. Mama Della, as they called her, was at church like she usually was. They were pretty excited the well came in. Uh, I think the Daisy Bradford uh, flowed about 20 barrels a day, and the Ludell Crim number one came in around 22,000 barrels. Everybody was excited, and they, they got in their horse and buggy and went to the church to get Mama Della to take her out to the well site, and she refused and said that she would see the well after church. In her mind, she was thinking, that oil has waited 62 years of my life. It can wait until the sermon's finished and the last amen is said. When church was over and she walked out, Malcolm was waiting for her at the front door and, and he said, Mama, it's come in, you need to go see it. And she said, well, if you think it's safe, I'll come. And so he drove his mother out to the farm and it said that the only person in Kilgore who was not overwhelmed with the discovery of oil was Lou Della Crim. I, I expect there were 200 people out there, but I know the cars were parked all up, up down the road and that oil just carted out all of the people that was out there watching. Humble Oil was willing to pay Malcolm Krim and Ed Bateman $1.5 million in cash and $600,000 in oil for their interest in the Lou Della No. 1. Malcolm Krim drove back to the mercantile store that he operated with his brother, John T., and sister Pauline. It was a place, he once said, where we sold everything from candy to caskets. I guess they survived pretty well on it. Uh, there was, of course, back then a lot of debt during the Depression, and, and most uh, articles for people shopping, they bought on credit. Times had been hard. The Great Depression had robbed a lot of people of their money and their dignity. Many were able to survive solely on handouts, the few vegetables they grew in their yards, and credit, especially credit. Malcolm Krim had been giving most of them credit for years. Some were several hundred dollars in debt, and some had no idea how or if they would ever be able to pay him back. Krim asked everyone who owed him money, which was almost everyone in Kilgore, to meet him down at the mercantile store. He knew that a lot of the people who had bought on credit were trying and working hard to, to pay off their account, but they'd probably never have a, enough money to do so. When the well came in and they knew they were gonna be fixed for a while, he uh, had a little ceremony at the Krim Mercantile store where he, he burned all the, the records on the, the people's credit and he said everybody was going to start with a clean slate. Malcolm Krim had other work to do. He emptied the store, leased the land beneath it, and began drilling. He would never again have to plead with anyone to sink a well on his land. 
either in town, under his store, or out on his mother's farm. Sam Ross was my uncle, and uh, he appeared on Wide Wide World. <laughs> they asked him what the difference the oil boom made, and he said, well, I used to go to the post office and get a bunch of bills, and now I go to the post office and get a bunch of checks. Oil traders spent every waking hour dealing in leases, royalties, percentages, anything that might bring them a dollar, honest, legal, or otherwise. Prices changed with each passing hour. A farmer no longer had to work hard. He could simply go to bed at night on 50 cent an acre land and wake up with the ground beneath him worth $400 an acre. And others were doing even better. 75 acres on the edge of the field brought $12,000. A driller sold 40 acres for $16,000. And a farmer near Dad Joyner's discovery well talked an oil scout into giving him $75,000 for a mere 14 acres. If you were lucky enough to have some land that had uh, mineral rights, then you were doing pretty well. Big money had not financed the field, and major oil companies had long scorned the region. As a result, the big oil companies had been on the outside looking in. Inevitably, big oil would ultimately control the oil patch of East Texas, but it made a lot of poor boys rich in the process. The oil field affected so many people and brought so much wealth to East Texas, and it, it really changed the world here during the Depression, and we were very lucky that, uh, to have that. Dad Joyner had been desperate for money when a young woman gave him $125 for a sublease on eight acres just a stone's throw away from the well site on Daisy Bradford's farm. Two days before the well blew in, she sold half of the lease for $10,000. A lady from Indiana invested $500 in the venture, sold a partial interest for $75,000, and earned another $200,000 from oil profits. Clint Murkison bent over a table in his Dallas office and drew a circle on a map around the Daisy Bradford and Lou Della Crim wells. He told his men, lease every inch of ground you can within that circle. Give them a dollar or two or five, whatever it takes, but get that land. The day had been long, the roads crowded, and the town packed. News of the strike out on Mrs. Lou Della's place began spreading through East Texas as soon as the first drop of oil touched the ground. Ed Bateman and Malcolm Krim rushed to Kilgore, but found they couldn't make a telephone call or even send a telegram. Oil scouts and speculators had beaten them to town. Krim would say, Ed couldn't get into the depot to send a wire because people were lined up ahead of him for 40 yards. In Kilgore, the railway telegraph would remain open 24 hours a day for the next five years. But even with wells producing at two different parts of the field, it was difficult for oil men to imagine a river of oil lying beneath East Texas shale and limestone. The, the best part of that field was almost right here, and uh, it went north of town somewhat. Kilgore was located on the east edge of the East Texas field, about midway. The field stretched from north to south for about 50 miles and east to west about 6 to 11 miles wide. The East Texas oil field, it, at the time it was the largest oil field in the world. Uh, it was the largest oil field until Alaska. The oil repository was maybe 40 miles long, that's big. That really kind of compared to the oil fields in Saudi Arabia. So the lake was really big and it, it covered a lot of territory. So after it was discovered, nobody knew how big it was. They didn't know. The only way you could find out is just start poking holes in the ground. And that's what they did. They poked, they poked thousands and thousands of holes in the ground until they discovered the boundary. A day later, thousands were crowding their way onto the roads that led to the promised land of Dad Joyner and Malcolm Krim. Drifters were looking for work, and oil meant money, and money meant jobs. 
and they elbowed their way into the richest oil field there ever was. Kilgore became an authentic boom town, and everything that you've ever heard about a boom town uh, was true in Kilgore. People came from all over. It was national depression and local boom. People came looking for fortunes, but they also came just looking for jobs. This happened right in the middle of the Great Depression. We were, we were, the United States was in the middle of a very difficult time. Then all of a sudden you have this, this really rich oil, oil discovery and, and you have all these oil operators that want to come here and looking for workers and things like that. So people just piled in here. There were thousands of cars down in Kilgore. There wasn't any place, they didn't have parking places marked off. They parked where they wanted to. And when a man got ready to go somewhere, I don't know how he got out because cars were parked in all directions, no parking area, all down the railroad track, both sides of the track. Just like the gold fields in California, it'd be the same kind of thing. And anybody who was a working man that heard about the oil field would try to get down here any way he could. There was very little living space. So most of them established their own company housing areas. They had the Magnolia Camp, Gulf Camp, uh, Sun, Sun Camp, Shell Camp. They had all those here. In a few weeks, there were men in khaki pants standing in every square inch of town. People were coming in and building anything to give them shelter. No one had a yard because yards were full of shacks and cars. When the first well blew in, Crown Dixon had the only restaurant in Kilgore. People ate with him, cooked their own meals, or did without. A few weeks later, he was surrounded by 143 cafes, and the eating joints and rib shacks were all packed as long as the grease was hot and something was frying. There was one man who came down and, and opened a, a hamburger place on the sidewalk. And he sat there with his little grill and he grilled hamburgers and sold them for a nickel apiece until he had sold enough hamburgers that he could buy a restaurant. Men came from all walks and stations of life. The big shots eased into Kilgore smoking big cigars and driving fancy cars. The hobos rode the rails. Wildcatters were bidding on leases and lease hounds were gobbling up every piece of ground they could rent, buy, or swindle. It's said that within 48 hours of the discovery of the Ludella Crim, there were 15,000 people within a mile of the depot. And those people had to be fed. They had no place to sleep. It was, uh, it was chaos. Within months, it had grown to 25,000 people. And all of a sudden, it was just tearing apart at the seams. There was no place for people to, to, to stay, no place for people to sleep. Uh, some folks in Kilgore would rent out their front porches for people to sleep on. In the early part of the days, Kilgore had hundreds and hundreds of people stacked on the street. People would come into town and park, get a newspaper, find out where they were drilling wells or who had wells to sell. And it was a wonderful, wonderful deal for those people. Roughnecks and roustabouts, mule skinners and rig builders swarmed the streets, sleeping in back alleys, in front yards where chickens were scratching in the dirt, beneath stairways, on vacant lots, wherever they could find a place to pitch a tent or spread a bedroll. The rains chilled them and soaked into their skin, but it didn't chase them away or prevent them from coming. Others broke into churches sleeping in sanctuaries as they sought shelter from the unrelenting rains. Kilgore was destined to be the oil capital of Texas. This is where the center of the oil boom existed. 